Welcome to the Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis. I'm Paul Ha, the director. And welcome to the 2010 Susan Sherman Distinguished Speaker Series. And tonight I am honored and really excited that we have Jerry Saul speaking to us. And Jerry is one of those amazing uh, quintessential New York figures. He's been around forever and in a, in a good kind of way. Um, <laughs> And the speaker series has allowed us to bring a director, Glenn Lowry, the director of Museum Modern Art, Maya Lin, an artist, Jeff Rosenheim, a curator, and an, education, an educator and a curator, Robert Storr, and now a critic with a capital C. And Jerry is just amazing. So Jerry Saltz, for those of you who don't know him and his work, he is um, an energetic voice in contemporary art. His voice is everywhere, whether it's on the streets of New York, wh whether it's on Facebook, whether it's on the blogosphere. He is, has this ever presence of permeating throughout contemporary art. He is currently the senior art critic for New York Magazine, but before that he had a, a very powerful and subversive role as the critic for The Village Voice. In 2006, he was named the best art critic by Time Out New York. He is two-time Pulitzer Prize finalist in criticism, and perhaps by being here tonight in St. Louis where, with our neighbor, he'll finally get one. <laughs> and in 1995, he was the sole advisor for the uh, Whitney Biennial, which was a very uh, amazing exhibition. And he has taught throughout. He is a fantastic teacher and a lecturer. He has taught at Yale, at Columbia, Art Institute of Chicago. He is a published author. He has very good books. And for the students here, there's a little tiny book that Freeze published in 1995, I believe. And it's all the books that Jerry thinks is really important for you as an artist to read. And if you can find it, if it costs $300 on eBay, you should absolutely buy it. Jerry is, of course, known for his work well, as a critic. But he is also known for someone who is a connector. He has 5,000 friends on Facebook, which is the maximum. And he writes daily on issues. And you know, he's, he's someone who walks into a room, says something, and says, now talk amongst yourself. And that's, what he, that's how he uses Facebook. And, the fact that he has so many friends is creates stories. People write about how is it that this guy has so many friends. He also creates um, buzz wherever he goes. So all the, th the topics that he writes, and I don't think he can friend any more people because I think 5,000 is the limit, but I think you can still see his page. And if you see the conversation that goes on, it truly is what's going on in contemporary art right now. He also creates controversy. And some of the things that he says, perhaps late at night in his bathrobe, writing on Facebook, creates controversy. And he's had some discussions with uh, very powerful New York curators and directors. And I believe he will continue to do so. Here's a little excerpt of what he wrote to the chief curator of PS1, uh, MoMA. And this is verbatim, except for the, I changed some of the wordings because it's inappropriate. <laughs> but that's, it's, that's the heartfelt response that it will give and, and, and to create conversations. And to put it out there, because if you're his friend, you can also comment on it. And he is so popular that people create things about him, such as this article which just popped up out of nowhere saying, Jerry Saltz resigns from New York Magazine, which created an incredible buzz in the blogosphere. He is so loved and wanted that people want to be Jerry Saltz. So there's this guy who says, I am fake Jerry Saltz, but he will write things that he thinks Jerry will want to write about. <laughs> He's also not opposed to a challenge, and when Glenn Beck went on TV to, to condemn contemporary art, he stood up, he boldly announced, he challenged Glenn to say, if you know so much about contemporary art, why don't you cur curate an exhibition? I don't think he's responded yet. He also does things that gets everyone's attention. There was a little 
event that he created where he said, you know, I've always wanted to, don't read down below, I'm going to change, um, to have an overnight at the Guggenheim Museum, and what would that feel like? And there's him going in, and there's him getting ready for the night with a hot rum toddy. Most recently, he got known for being on television at the, the national uh, Bravo television show, Work of Art, where he was one of the few judges who had a really interesting critical discourse on the pieces. And it was really interesting to hear Jerry talk about how editing process is done and what gets left in and what gets cut out. Best thing about Jerry, and, that, and that's his wife, uh, Roberta Smith, who's the art critic at New York Times. Jerry is everywhere in New York, and I lived in New York for a long time, and every opening that you should be at, every show that you should go see, every thing that's art-related, Jerry and Roberta would be there. So he, his knowledge of New York and the contemporary art and what's been going on is, is vast. And the best thing about Jerry is that he is, he is hugely important. He's informed, he's now, he's current, sometimes controversial, he's quintessential New York art world. But better than that, he is the champion of the artist. He always fights for the underdogs, and once you get to know him, he's a nice guy. And with that, I want to welcome Jerry Saltz. Thank you very, very much, Paul. That's the best introduction of me I've ever heard. I like it so much that I even started to like me. Uh, I mean, I love me, but it's hard to like, each of us loves you, and then it's hard to like yourself. Um, I'm really touched by that. Um, are any of you in this room my Facebook friends? Raise your hand. There's one, I see Wendy is there. Uh, Eva, of course, Buzz Spector, Paul, yay. Uh, and you guys in the back, ha <laughs> ha, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, Paul is right, I am at a 5,000 person limit, but there's little wiggle room. You might want to send a message that says, friend me. And the reason I say that is, I'll probably just click yes, you don't have to say anything witty. Um, because I accidentally did start this conversation on Facebook. Uh, you do, most things we do, I think we do, we do by accident. You go looking for one thing and something else finds you. Do you know what I mean? Artists, let me ask you this. Can you pick exactly what you do? Can you choose your style? Can you, of course, you're the one that kind of decided you'll be, I will be a painter. Uh, I will make abstract paintings, I suppose. You can decide that. But the more you're around art, I think the more you realize that art is stranger than that. You don't choose it. I hate to say something so kind of new age, hocus pocus, but in many ways, your art is using you to make it. Art may, I think art is a cosmic force. Do I sound just like a hippie now? <laughs> I think art, oh, here's my notes. You know, I thought, can I talk about cosmic forces without a note? Uh, whatever. I think art, well, let me ask you this. Can art change the world? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, now, that was kind of a trick question. Can art stop the spread of AIDS in sub-Saharan Africa? Can art, it can? With advertising, okay. Can art cure famine and stop drought? Well, not drought, drought's a natural thing. That we could, we don't know. I guess what I'm saying is I think that art, the answer to my question, can art change the world, to me is yes and no. That art is part of a universal force, a cosmic force, that does change the world by osmosis, which is in a way like your advertising thing. 
and incrementally over time. Every once in a great while, you can be around, and some people in this room may have feel like they've witnessed it, I do, feel like they've witnessed the train of art history suddenly leaping off the tracks. Boom! And landing on another track and going in another direction. Can you name me a time in American art when that may have happened? 1960? I think I'm with you. And what was its name? Its name was pop art. You don't have to love pop art. It's not an easy art to love. It's an easy one to get kind of enraptured with, sleep with for a night, you know, wake up the next morning and go, what am I doing here? I love the way it smiled. No, I, is this bad in St. Louis? No. <laughs> um, with Andy Warhol. Suddenly, I think you have the train, not with Johns and Rauschenberg so much, as that is the last one hundredth of a milli nanosecond of European art history in them. You can still feel the facture of the hand, the surface, the authority even of the brush. But with Andy Warhol, like him or hate him, it doesn't matter to me, the train of art history suddenly leaps off the tracks, doesn't it? And you have what are Warhol's real inventions? If you think about it, Jackson Pollock took something that had been there since the beginning. The drip. The drip. We laugh, but it was on the cave wall. And you know how the cave painters got it up there? They spit. Oh, you are an artist, aren't you? Yeah, they did that. You, you, you baby artists. Little tough love, I'm sorry. You baby artists, I love you, but the painters in the room, uh, most paintings are uh, square or rectangle. They're painted on something we call canvas. You never think about, by the way, the fact that canvas is the material that was used to wrap the dead for 5,000 years, and it therefore is imbued with an extraordinary um, content. I love you. It's a little tough love. You don't think about that most of the paintings put on canvas for 5,000 years in Egypt, by the way, or stone or walls, were never meant to be seen by human eyes. Were they? They were meant to be seen in the afterlife and the underworld by the gods. Maybe it's God's fault. You know, in the Judeo-Christian thing, I think that the second commandment or the fourth, you tell me, is this one. Thou shalt not have any other God. I forget, you know, I don't know what version I'm using because I'm Jewish. Uh, <laughs> Craven or is it Graven? Thank you. Thou shalt have no gods before me because I, thy Lord, your God, am a jealous God. First of all, do you know what God is telling you, you dopes? God is kind of saying, I know there are other gods. He just said, I'm the, no, I'm the only God. And yet he admits in the second commandment, I am a jealous God. Don't worship like the sun disk God in Egypt. And don't like sail your boat just 12 hours to Greece, 12 lousy hours over to Greece. And they've got like gods of the grass, gods of the mountains, the gods are having sex with human beings. It's unbelievable what's going on over in Greece. <laughs> it's just insane. And they're on the end, who, the, whoever wrote these books, right, or whatever, if it's a god, that's fine with me is also on the other end of the Silk Road. And you can't believe the things that were being brought in from China and India, and every single god is having sex in every single piece. My god! No wonder he said, I I'm very jealous. I would be jealous if I were that god. And also there were rumors of boats going to Italy, and who knows what the Italians were doing. OK. But thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, okay? In other words, you could make, you could have art, but long as it didn't look like 
um, God, is that it, or the human being? Because God makes people in the world, and God asked artists not to do that. Don't, uh, the job description is mine. If you think about it, wouldn't that make Marcel Duchamp the most spiritual holy God in all of history? Because he says, I will not make art, I will identify something that is already in the world, a urinal, and I will deem it art. An art, a work of art that changes what art is. It's a urinal still, and you still have to be able to explain that to your parents. It's very tough. Mom, it's still a urinal, and it's kind of creepy to be looking at there. But then you have to say, Mom, it changed the idea of all, this is back to the train of art history. It changed all the works of art ever made, and it's a comment on all the works, rather, made, that have ever been made. Even your lousy art, no matter how bad you are, you, every work of art you make is a comment on every work of art ever made. And you're putting it in the caboose of art history, and god darn it, it does get pulled along with it. And someday, I hate you for this because they're going to forget me and the curators and the dealers and the collectors. Oh, we hate all of you. I'm on the train and you're not. Someday, people may start to sniff around that funny smell aversal smell you're putting off and put, with their nose down near the ground and pick up a scent that leads them either to you or, or to someone near you or away from you if you're especially stinky. Jackson Pollock, those painters don't just paint back in the caves. They painted mammals. Who here has seen a cave painting? I have, you have, you have, anybody else? I want to ask you if you had, I've seen them, I went in southern France to a small cave which still meant walking like a mile into the earth where it was like freezing and we only were allowed to use flashlights and even then we had to turn off our flashlights and only the guide could put a flashlight on it and when I saw the hoof of one mammal I knew in a billionth of a second they were making art. All the weird things we told ourselves about, oh, the caves are magic, or they're like this, or they're like that, they might be that. But this is the most extraordinary observation of mammals, possibly in the history of our species. Who depicted mammals better? Who? Stubbs is pretty good. With the horses, I would take a Stubbs, but I'd rather have a cave painting. So would you. What's the most common thing painted in the caves? Mammals. What's the second most common thing painted in the caves? The handprints. And here's how those painters made paintings, you babies. I love you. They put pulp in their mouth. They could have mixed up paint and put it on the end of a hard stick brush with hair on the end and stuck it to a canvas or, well, not canvas because it hadn't been invented yet. Um, they put pigment in their mouth and pulp in their mouth and they did just what you said. They put their hand on the wall and they went <laughs> like that. And then they pulled their hand away and they made the first photograph. They made an imprint, a trace of self, of the excess energy. And you know to this day when you trace something while you're on the phone to a friend that there's a strange endorphal release in you that you've made a trace of the world. You've made a urinal, you dummies. And your mom is making them too. That's the second most common thing. That's how they made the hands. And by the way, we now know beyond a shadow of a doubt that half of the hands, half, are women's hands. Duh. Everybody was in the caves. <laughs> and only, don't forget, by the way, 1% of 1% of 1% of 1% of all the cave paintings and caves survive. That's all. We're so lucky when you bump into one. There's almost none. Um, I haven't been to the redone one of Lascaux. Have you been to the, fa the fake one? The real one. You are a holy person, Wendy. Yeah, who here has seen the real one? Yeah, we should just give you a dollar, everybody in the room. 
Well, the fake one, I'm told, is, is just as good. They say it's rainy in there and cold, and it's really good. Um, half of the hands are by women. It means that everybody was in the caves, and anyone could make art just like now. It's an all-volunteer army, my prophets. It's an all-volunteer army. So when we complain bitterly about the art world, which is our job, oh, I hate this, I hate that museum, I hate this person, I hate that gallery, the truth is every single person is doing it because they have to do it. No person in this room should make art unless they absolutely, positively have to make it. I would not wish the life on anyone. It's ungodly amounts of time alone. Although artists, they always, you call them, and they go, you want to have a drink? And, and, and the rest of the people in the world are going, excuse me, I have a job. You know, writers, uh, you know this, Sally. Writers, uh, we're always working. You talk to a painter, it's like, oh yeah, I'm, I went out today and I uh, got a cardboard box. <laughs> and you ask a writer what they're doing, you're going, Oh, I was in hell for 18 hours. Anybody here ever written? Who here has written? You know what it's like. Would you do? Isn't that a terrible job? It's like running a life in first gear. And every there's for me as a writer, there's no such thing as writing. I wish that there were, that I could sit down, boom, and it would come out, and I would be happy. But I write, and then I rewrite, and there's only rewriting for me. There is only rewriting for me. And I write every six days. Every six days, I panic, and I, like you, I think that my work is no good, just like you. Although, well, I'll get to you artists in a minute. <laughs> By the way, what was the third most common thing in the caves? St. Louis. They're penises and vulvas, <laughs> which tells you what? What does it tell you? <laughs> You're laughing. <laughs> yeah, penis I'm not saying it again, for God's sake. <laughs> um, you decide what it tells you. It tells you that those people in those caves were doing just what you used to do as a kid, which was look up naughty words. Now I have no idea what kids are looking up on the internet. It's insane, uh, but that's what they were doing. It tells you kids were back in the caves, too, that everybody was there. And the painting was something that anyone who wanted to could do. And many of the young painters in this room, when you were very young, you were doing one of several things. My guess is you were either lying on the floor pretending the ceiling was the floor. Anybody here done that? Look at all the hands going up, you mentals. <laughs> yeah, these two are like, oh, they're together going, oh, yeah, we used to do that. <laughs> um, how many of you at one day just started drawing with crayons or whatever on the wall? Bunches of them. You ruined so many apartments and hotel rooms. And, but something was happening. You were telling you. The art is a cosmic force that, like us, is a self-replicating energy. Art is reproducing itself. What is art for? Why? I don't think that art is optional. I think since art was here from the beginning, art is not merely a decorative hedge in front of the great kingdom of civilization. I think it's all part of the same ball of wax that it's only our desire to separate them out and say, well, art is a uh, decorative, uh, unnecessary force. And my answer is, well, yeah, I can understand why it seems that way, because when we look at a, a glitter painting of a panda, you think, well, that's not necessary, is it? <laughs> and, but it turns out, for whatever we are, it is necessary. I don't know why. God knows why. But we're doing it again. We're doing it again, rather. Um, <laughs> Art is not optional. The, Lawrence Weschler writes about the head jurist of the war crimes trial in The Hague uh, in Bos about Bosnia. 
some of the worst crimes of that decade, the 1990s. And he asked this judge, head of the war crimes trial, how do you listen to this, these horrendous stories all day long? And the judge said, I go to The Hague. You know what The Hague is? This is where the Vermeers live. It's the house where Vermeer lives. And Weschler said to him, ah, you go to see the Vermeers. Uh, um, among the most beautiful things on the face of the earth, to feel better. And the judge said, no, that is not why I go there. I do go to see the Vermeers, but I, I do not think I'm going there because they're beautiful. And he was asked, why? What's going on? What are you getting from the paintings? And he said, well, I go to the Vermeers because the Vermeers were invented to heal pain. Sometimes in the art world, we limit things. We say we're a free world, an open world, but the minute you behave freely, often the art world will knee-jerk and hate you. I'm the first to admit that being on a reality TV game show about art is probably going a little too far. <laughs> probably I went a little bit too far. But I don't think that we must ever, ever, ever reduce art to uh, like a formula like beauty. That's an empty thing. Everybody believes in beauty. I hate to tell you that, where you go, oh, I'm about beauty, man. You really want to say to them, Osama bin Laden would say that. He would tell you he's like beauty. Or I believe in truth. Oh, really? Well, who doesn't? It's almost like all the politicians that say, I'm for the children. Well, God almighty, unless you're a sociopath, you're, you're for the children. It's the same in the art world. When Dave Hickey originally said beauty, he, in, he reintroduced an idea, didn't he, into the discourse that had been sort of lost in the academization of the art world, and that is one of the things that the generation right before me suffered. I, believe, I don't have any degrees, so I'm kind of oversensitive and, you know, defensive. I do have two honorary degrees. <laughs> I ask my friends to call me Dr. Doctor. I ask them to make me a proctologist and a cardiologist, <laughs> but they don't. <laughs> um, so I guess I did have a need for like the cowardly lion or uh, whoever, who was it, the tin man that needed a degree and I needed one. Um, scarecrow. I feel more like, when I was identifying as the tin man, I felt bad just now. I was thinking, I don't feel hollow. Whatever I am, it's not that. I'm a mess inside. There's something in here. Um, a mess that loves himself. This is not self-hate. It's, it's a bad form of self-love. Um, I forgot how I got over here. Um, what was the last thing I was saying before? Truth. I love you. She's taking notes. Okay, good. Okay, reintroduce an idea that because the art world had been academicized, and I'm afraid that we lost a generation of critics to ac the academic discourse. I believe in that discourse because without it, women would not. That there's a liberation philosophies and theories are part of that discourse. So never throw out the baby with the bathwater. The people that I hate most, you know, it's like they talk about this theory or that theory. And they get on your nerves. But the people that get on my nerves the most are the people that go, theory, I hate theory. And I always look at them and I go, that's your theory, you dummy. <laughs> and your theory is the most intolerant theory. It's, it's, it's a tea party thing. The one thing about the tea party, I apologize if you're in it, but I'd like to kill you. <laughs> because you lie. So do I. Is, it's almost like saying, I believe, I hate irony. I only believe in sincerity. But do you understand how ironic a statement that is. The Tea Party is a party that only has sincerity. And when you have no irony, you have death to me. 
Uh, Oscar Wilde once said, all bad poetry is sincere. <laughs> it's a tricky, yeah, no. He didn't, he's tricky. We all must read a couple of his essays once every five years because it will test you. Believe me, you'll kind of sit down going, I thought I was smart, but I have to rethink some of this. A generation was lost to this academicization that didn't, couldn't, It's like doctors on call. If you're not a cardiologist, yeah, I can't. Okay. I don't mind. Um, they lost, they did not believe, here's what they believed. They believed Descartes. I think, therefore I am. But in the art world, my prophets, we know that it is I experience, therefore I am. You are all, I hate to say it, more like the Marquis de Sade. In your minds, you've thought mm, unusual things. You're not Voltaire. You're not Descartes. You have another side, not just one side, but what Whitman is right. You contain multitudes. What's the first part of that, Sally? I contradict myself. I contradict myself very well then. I am large. I contain multitudes. That's what you tell art critics that give you any guff. <laughs> you do. We contain multitudes. We can't boil it down to truth, beauty, uh, and all those other wonderful things. And particularly, I hate to say this, men, it's our people that do it. We're an insecure people. You can't hate us. I don't know why I would hate us. But we're an insecure, nervous people who like to order the world. Our names are Plato, and we're, who over his uh, academy it said, no one allowed here that does not believe in geometry, it does not believe in triangles. Only a man would write, yes, I'm giving my life to triangles. <laughs> Because it's a denial, needless to say, of Whitman's chaos. You are chaos. Art does not come from anything purebred ever, never will, never has, never gonna. Never. That platonic dialogue is just a male wish for order. Because, well, we're a nervous people. I don't know what it is about us, but we just are. We need to know when dinner is how to get there, we're going to read the map, but we're very good at finding the ladder in the attic. Have you ever noticed that? I know you can too. We lost a generation that was afraid, I think it was fear, to simply put out opinion. I like this, and this is why. Never I just like this. That's boring to go, oh, I hate Titanic. I love Titanic. I'm much more interested in hearing you say, Titanic is the story of, a, of the art world, really, if you think about it, of something going from a state of horizontality to a state of verticality in real time. One of the things that moved me in watching that three-hour, billion-dollar movie, hated Avatar. It looked like the side of a van to me, <laughs> or, or like a celestial seasonings uh, package. Hate, and this is the only movie I've ever seen where people with no clothes are completely asexual. <laughs> it's like everyone in the world is Richard Dreyfus or something. <laughs> and the movie Titanic, you can like or dislike because it happened in real time. In those three hours, the boat hits the, t the, the iceberg at the half hour point in the movie, and for the next two hours, that's how long it took the world to change, for a way of life to end. And that really is what happened when I was at the Freeze Fair in 2007, on the day that Lehman Brothers and the stock market fell down and the stock market dropped 700 points for the second time. I looked around me and I saw something I'd never seen before at an art fair. Stunned silence of dealers, young dealers, Ronnie, you look at me. Were you there that day? 
they must, the young dealers must have said to you what they said to me. I mean, here's one of the heroes of the art world. We don't actually have an art world without one of these pillars. Um, they were saying things to me like, what's happening, Jerry? <laughs> and I said, oh, this is what the art world looks like 99% of the time. <laughs> you just happen to live through about, you know, 96 amazing months, a time when money came into the land, more money possibly than had ever been here, ever before. And I'm not unhappy about that. I want all of the, the you artists in the back row to make as much money as all the people in the front row. I want you to be, I want artists to be rich. It's good. There's nothing wrong with money. You know, it's like the people that write, they wished the art world to have no money. And I always say to them, look, it's a bit, look, the air is dirty, but we breathe it. Artists, I hate to say this about you, but you love money. <laughs> the artists, you just love it. You're so weird if you think about it. How many people in this room own cats? How many own dogs? God, the dog people sort of sat together. This is weird. Okay, what's your dog's name? How can I top that? <laughs> Quesadilla, thingy, thingy, thing, thing, thing. What a name. Casey. Casey, that's a dog name. You had a dog? What? Sambo. Sambo. Dog names? There. Murphy. What is Murphy, a lab? A what terrier? Like I know what an Irish Wheaton terrier is. What? Say. That's a dog. <laughs> okay, so here's what happens. When you call it, I'm trying to explain to you artists who you are now, and to us what they, what they do and how they think, what they make. If you call a dog, here's what happens. You go, Murphy, come here. And Murphy will kind of go, ha, 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 and come over, put his, her head on your lap and kind of drool. I'm a cat person, so that's much too much connection for me. <laughs> Way too much, you know, neediness. <laughs> oh my God, get it out of here. <laughs> when your dog, what you don't know about your dog, let me just tell you a few things, you dog people, because this is off subject. Maybe the whole lecture's been off subject. But... <laughs> Whenever you're not home, you know what your dog's doing? It's barking all day long, and your neighbors are in sheer hell. And every dog owner goes, no, not my Murphy. No, nope, not my quesadilla. Nope, not my Sambo. And, and I'm here to tell you, yes, they're barking all day long. Then the minute you walk in, they're like, hmm, hmm, hmm. <laughs> The other thing is, and they do this with me, the minute they meet me on a country road, they go, I'm going to kill you. You want to rumble, mother? And I, every time I take a walk in the country, I have to, I walk until your dog starts to bite me, and then I turn around. And I can't go past that point again for the rest of the bloody summer. So I have each direction mapped out, and now all the dogs are sitting around going, here he comes. <laughs> the northern dog has me, the eastern dog. Okay. That's a direct communication with another species when you're having communication. With dogs, in a sense, didn't they domesticate us? Aren't they brilliant? Aren't they genius? Eating in packs was hard, especially warring with other packs of wolves. They figured out that those mammals, the very, very smelly mammals that ate dead cooked food, threw a lot of stuff out. And they, the most brave wolves could come closer, uh, generation by generation, they could come closer until they domesticated us. They figured out ways to make themselves useful, and we gave them the most useful things on earth to them. If they could bark and warn us of like an approaching coyote, then the dog has protected us, and we give it one of our scraps of meat and let it live in the garage. They have food and shelter. What a deal. We end up, and then we breed them and whatever. They bred us, you dummies. 
It's just like art. They dem it's much more complicated than we ever, we are, we contain multitudes. So you've had a direct communication with another species when you're speaking to a dog, and it's speaking to you. How many people here own cats? Where are the cat people? Oh, hi, cat people. What's your cat's name, Buzz? Tucker. Tucker. Notice how the, the cat names will be very different. Charlie. Charlie. Good and bad. Good and bad. Cute. Any others? Any cat people? Look, the cat people really have needs to tell you. Yes? Steve. Steve. That's a very non, is that, did your kid name Steve? A rescue cat. Yeah, Steve is uh, not the best animal name. But, bushy? Butchy. Butchy. That's kind of a cat, dog, dog, cat name. It's a girl, too. It's a girl. Yeah, you're confusing your animal. <laughs> Any other cat names here? One more. Myla. Myla. Who said that? Myla. Okay, here's what happens if, when you call Myla, okay? Or Bushy, or even Steve. You go, come here, Milo. Milo, whatever. And here's what Milo will do. So uh, imagine that's you right in front of me. I'm Milo. That's the couch. Now watch what m the cat will do. It'll go, and then go like this. and it sits down. <laughs> Do you see what's happened? Something extraordinary. Artists, you are cats. The cat put a third thing between itself and you in order to communicate. You see what it did? It put the couch, it couldn't do what the dog can do. Dog, I need you, you need me, F you, okay? <laughs> We're stuck together. Cats don't work that way. Cats work like artists in a way. You guys, most of us in the front of the room, we are relatively unhappy and happy, and we kiss our boyfriends and girlfriends and mates and whatever, husbands, wives, uh, pets and dogs, and we're happy to be loved and to love. End of story. You artists want to be loved by everyone everywhere for the rest of time. <laughs> That's pretty weird. You guys are messed up. And what's really, really messed up about you is then you do this. You put something there and you go, if this is your art, this like silver thing, you go, love me. Forever. Give me $45,000. Put it at the museum and make, give me a business class ticket to Turin and Venice and I will install it there. <laughs> and you make fun of us? We are all dark but splendid. You understand? You contain multitudes. A generation is lost to academia of not being able to say, I like this, I don't like this for this reason. Back to the Titanic. If you put out the reasons in a clear and articulate way, a generation is lost in language, seduced by the very high level, intense English translations of French theory, never read in their original, okay? Which is fine, I can't read, I've never read Dante in Italian, but I trust it. Um, <laughs> the language is, became inaccessible and defensive and kind of authoritative. The opinion is gone, the juice is gone, the life is gone, everything is gone, the taste of the fathers is worshipped by the children in this generation. A Freudian nightmare takes place, and, and this is no good, and it's changing now, right now. 
right now, I've been seeing it over the last four or five years, that the language is loosening up. The language is smart. Listen, while I don't have a degree, about 99.999% of the art world does, and I'm fine with that. I teach. You go to school, good. You're going to graduate. You know the secret handshake. You know the codes. You low a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> uh, I did go to school for a couple of years, artists, and I accrued a lot of school loans, and I didn't pay it for seventeen years. I'm sorry. Every single time the phone rang in my house for the first seventeen years, and I don't know if you're my kind of person. I hope you're not. I would listen very carefully to hear if I could hear kind of a long distance anonymous feel on the other end. And any time I did, I'd say, Jerry Saltz moved, I think, to California or maybe Missouri <laughs> a few months ago. Maybe if he used to live here. And, and, you know, occasionally it really was the lone people. Now it's harder. I understand with computers and stuff. But don't be afraid of those student loans. Don't be afraid of them. You're going to drag them around your whole life no matter what. No matter what. No matter what. So don't, don't get scared of those people. The conventionality of just making paintings, this maybe the most visionary tool ever invented by our species to, to envision the world, this machine that absolutely nothing is real inside of a painting. Everything is real outside of it. But nothing except it is real inside, OK? Emily Dickinson wrote a great first line of one of her 600 and how many uh, uh, great poets in front of me. Let's say 690 some uh, sonnets, poems. Great first line. And don't read her because it just takes a lifetime to understand her. <laughs> and, and I want you to read her, but it really, she's so good, nobody understood absence and like the hyphen like her. That you, she'd put a hyphen in a sentence, you'd go, oh my god, a hyphen. <laughs> it's almost like that movie The Shining by uh, Kubrick. Did you ever see that? At one point, the word Tuesday flashes on the screen, and the entire audience goes, ah! <laughs> that, that's, it's so fine-tuned, some of these arts. She says, I dwell in possibility. That's what she meant by poetry. It also has a downside of like not knowing if I've attained yet. You know, I dwell in my mind in what may be the future. But if you think about form and format, the tools that we use, I dwell in possibility. Life is possibility. Poetry, painting is possibility. It stuns me that painting has been just reduced to a very, very narrow discourse about whatever, I don't even really know. And we pretend it never was about flatness, not really. You want to ask Jackson Pollock if those drips were about flatness? He'd go, huh? <laughs> they, no, nobody would say that it's about flatness. Warhol's great invention, like Pollock before him, he discovered something that was there from the beginning. He put colors together that no one had ever put together before in the history of the world. It's like pop music. Three chords. They exist. They're put together in a slightly different beat tempo and a slightly different pattern with new instruments. It always helps to have new tools, new materials. Art is the, embedded, the power to be able to embed thought in material. For the poet, poetry is material. You have to understand that. I'm the last living person that likes Matthew Barney. For Matthew, <laughs> for Matthew Barney, narrative is a material, you see? You embed thought in material. That's what really great art is, and that's what Warhol did. Other people had used repetition. That wasn't really that new. And some of the poppy subject matter, again, Rauschenberg, who was sleeping with everybody in town, and I'm told every single person that ever met him went, I love Robert Rauschenberg. <laughs> he just put off the vibe. He put off the vibe. That's how I felt when I met Matthew Barney. I was the first person to write on him. 
And whenever I'm around, and I have a blind spot for his work. The other, for me, that was a moment of the art history train. Not the art history train, but art, not the history train. Art jumping off the tracks. For you guys, it's not a big deal, it's fine. When I saw his work the first time I was with my wife in a bad group show, in a bad gallery in New York City, Althea Viafora, God love her, she's a really great person. The gallery since closed. It was a bad group show with a million artists and my wife and I walked in because I see 30 or 40 shows a week because I believe that bad art teaches you as much as good art. In fact, my prophets, I actually think it can tell you more sometimes because when we go to MoMA, the real tragedy of MoMA, of spending a billion dollars on this you know, handsome building. It's handsome from the outside. What they don't know in the art world still doesn't get the truth is we don't care what the, build, the museums look like from the outside. The truth really is. You want to make them pretty from the outside? Yay. It's very pretty or it's very ugly. We only care about the inside. Give us enough space for this, this machine this greatest visionary machine in the history of our species, a little thing we call art, give it enough space and let people take a look at it. And they forgot to do that at MoMA. They didn't build a single square foot more with the billion dollars than they had knocked down. Instead, they built more people moving space, more party space, much handsomer space. Again, I, again I'm not against or for architects. But you can only see the tops of the Himalayas at this beautiful museum, this Garden of Eden where all of us are from. We all return to the garden to commune with the ancestors too. We must never turn our back on this sad, sad, sad garden because you're all from there. And it's how you can replenish yourself in your own engine by going back to the sad garden. I'm not crying. Um, for me, I kind of forgot how I got here because I get so emotional about MoMA. Barney was just a moment, I'm trying to say, where I thought I saw one possible future of art, contemporary art, of way of artists would be transmuting Joseph Boys and Joan, uh, Jonas and a lot of other, Nauman obviously, a lot of 70s art, I suddenly saw a body that seemed to be transmuting the fat of Joseph Boys into muscle or something else to narrative in his own body and I was absolutely floored, breathless, astonished. The back of my head felt like it was on fire and I went and got my wife, Roberta Smith, who I, I love my work, I think she's the real deal. You should have her here. She's not as user friendly, but she's hardcore, you know, a gatekeeper, you know. I'm more of a key master, like, oh, take the key, I don't care. <laughs> Stay out late, just be home by two if you can. And where Roberta's like, where were you? <laughs> what have you done? I got Roberta and I said, you know, come here, honey, come here. And it was, a, you know, Barney crawling up and down, putting Vaseline in his belly button. And I said, look at this videotape. And she looked at it for a long time. And I, and I was, like, getting ready for her to say, the future has, you know, this is Bruce Springsteen, you know. And she looked at me and went, I said, what do you think? What do you think, honey? She said, it's so male. <laughs> and she walked away and she's never thought about Barney. So to each their own in the art world. Warhol took these colors that had never been put together and what is other, what's the other great formal invention that Warhol did? He allowed the silk screens to skid. Just nothing, just a thing where everyone else before then had either made them intentionally dada and messy like the great Rauschenberg, our Picasso, whether you like him or not. Yeah, he probably should have hung up his brushes at some point. But the more you look at Rauschenberg, are you guys having this? You look at Rauschenberg from the 70s and you're like, it's much better than we thought. 
much better. Even some of those silly cardboard boxes that he was folding, I was looking at them going, oh my God. <laughs> Even, you know, you start to trust certain artists that they're telling you something like cats. That Warhol, unlike a Dada gesture of making it messy or, or minimalism which made it neat, Warhol, that was his content of his self. He gave up the authority of the brush. He gave up the authority of the surface. He gave up the authority of painting. And that is breathtaking. People would look at that work and go, they still look at it and go, you know, what is that? If you cut, and you know who else has this a little? Jeff Koons, you may hate him too. If you sliced these guys open and sent a space probe into them, for 50,000 miles they travel, let's just say, they'll hit nothing. These guys did it. All artists are trying to take the inside and put it on the outside. Without, and this is a Heisenberg uncertainty, almost impossibility, without changing what the inside really looks like. But needless to say, the minute you attempt to show the inside, you're changing it. By just saying, look at me dance naked in public. Already you're saying, I'm a needy dog. You know, <laughs> I'm a weird person. What my parents didn't give me is taking a lifetime to fill. Sorry. But they successfully turned themselves, they found a way to do it, inside out and emptied themselves um, so that what you see on the surface is what they are. Now that's not good or bad, but that's miraculous. You try to do that. That's why Warhol's still of strange interest to us, this strange creature that made irony a content and irony is nothing other than the awareness of being able to step outside of oneself and go, oh, I'm here. That's all irony is. It does, it's not always a negative irony. Anyway, I've been babbling. I haven't really, I didn't finish uh, Jackson Pollock. I could have gone all the way back to him and said, the things he made, he dripped. He discovered something that had been left there for, since the beginning that no one used. And he only dripped for 48 months, you guys. You make fun of him as Jack the Dripper. You ever seen paintings of Pollock painting, uh, pictures of Pollock painting? Here's how he dripped, very femme. <laughs> you know, yes, he had a cigarette in his mouth, but he was bald. And these guys waited much longer than we all do for fame. They waited into their 40s and sometimes 50s. And they were bitter male alcoholics. And you will be too, <laughs> even you women. And they lived in a world without women, not ours. So, you know, it was effed up. I know that. But what Pollock did, and what I'm going to ask you if you can do before I finish, and I want to maybe show a couple pictures too, is he painted, he dripped for 48 months. He became this most famous artist. He sold his work. He did this while he was sober, as most of you know. Um, and then he thought, I'm repeating myself. Artists, listen to me. He thought, I'm repeating myself. And so he will, willingly went back to hell of not knowing what he was doing. I'm going to say a, an artist's name who I don't think did that. So I don't want you to get mad at me because I'm an art critic, so I'm allowed to say what I do and don't like. You're allowed too, but whatever. <laughs> Jim Dine never did that. He made his hearts and robes and birds and Pinocchios, and he just kept making them. And he's a bazillionaire, and he gets to sleep with anybody, and he's in the art history books, and good for him. But Pollock, this guy you make fun of a lot, 48 months of dripping, that's it. And then he decides, I'm going to change my work. I'm going to go back to hell, willingly. And needless to say, it killed him. Started drinking again, and he killed himself, basically. Mondrian knew he was dying. 
He knew he was dying, and all the directors of all the museums on the East Coast had been in his studio about a month before, and they saw a painting that was better than Broadway Boogie Woogie, that he figured out the next steps from Broadway Boogie Woogie. And then he died a few weeks later. They went back in the studio, and he had completely painted out that painting and changed it, knowing he could never ever finish it. Why did he do that, artists? Why did he do it? Buzz Spector rightfully says, I thought he did it because something else came to him. Even though he knew he would never finish it, he knew, you know? Does that make him brave? Makes him an artist. You make what you can make because you can't not make it. Look at Philip Guston. I want you to find your inner Guston artists. Tell, if, can you imagine what Guston would have thought of himself at the beginning of his career if I said to him, dude, by the end of your career, you're going to be painting big, bulbous, hairy uh, Ku Klux Klansmen <laughs> driving around smoking cigars. He would say, well, I'll just kill myself now. Artists, you must be able, not must, but I want you to think about inventing a machine in your work, allowing a machine to be invented in your work that creates things that you cannot predict that it will spin off. That's why I like Matthew Barney's work. That's the only reason. I just think he might be as surprised as you are, hating it or liking it, about what's coming out. Some artists just need to paint dots. What happens if you wake up in the morning and you go, I'm a dot painter. <laughs> There's a couple of stripe painters in the room going, oh shit, I paint stripes. <laughs> There's the rectangle painters and the square painters and the blotch painters and the, you know, the fog painters. When artists come to me in school and say, you know, I, I paint you know, blotches, Jerry. And my teachers are saying, well, everybody's already painted kind of blotchy paintings. I always say to artists, never ever listen to anybody that says to you, it's been done before. Never. That was my paradigm. We, Wendy, I, some of us, we lived in another period when that was really crucial, that that was radical, that was revolutionary, it was about make it new. But that's silly now. So when artists now say to me, May, that's too almost Descartes. It's a mind-body separation because nothing is really new. Nothing. It's just art reproducing itself through you. What I say to my students is, to, when, when they say, you know, the, the teacher said, uh, you, it's already been made, I always, I always say, make it again and make it again. And let's just say you need to paint the American flag. That's a tough one if that's your assignment. And I would say, eh, you know, it's been done before. But I would still say, do it again. Try doing it 30, 40, 50, 60 times and call me in the 10s, 20s, 30, 40, and we'll see if you got anything. And if you don't, at the end I'll say, eh, maybe make it the Turkish flag. Everybody likes the Turkish flag or the Brazilian flag is good. Or like if you're Israeli, you could maybe throw that in. I don't know. I'm not an artist. But if I'm okay with you doing that which is done before because art is not an option. It's part of a cosmic force that's been here from the beginning. It's still here. It is what it is. We don't know what it is. That's the interesting thing. Nobody can define what it is. It doesn't have, doesn't have that kind of, it is what you guys make, is what art is. It's a tautology that way, but that's not my problem. Um, I should stop now because I have been talking for an hour and that's probably too long. I'd love to take some questions. Here would be the conditions. You gotta ask a question. You can't make a statement. You know, it gives everybody a headache. I've already given you a headache, so don't ruin the night more by making, you have to ask a simple, direct, loud question. Like you might want to know, how do you get famous? 
How do you do this? How do you do that? Why on God's name were you on a reality TV show? Um, anything you've ever, I haven't even talked about my work. As usual, I've talked about yours. But before I ask for questions, I'll just say thank you very, very much, St. Louis, for this museum. I want to say this in closing. In New York, I live in a ready-made art world. I do. I love my art world. I can't live without it. I'm desperate to be in it. But it's there for me. And whenever I go to any gallery in New York, I always pretend like I'm not thrilled to bump into you. But secretly inside, I'm always like, in the art world in New York, it's there for me. In St. Louis, you had to make it out of yourselves, what Barnett Newman said. When they asked, how are you making this art world? He said, we are making it out of ourselves. There are heroes in this room, great pillars, unbelievable rope right now in this building is being unspooled by, uh, uh, under the uh, uh, tutelage of Paul Ha of allowing his very good curators enough rope to curate crapola shows. <laughs> That's what we're looking for. You know, fail for me, but just fail flamboyantly. Don't fail the way we're failing in Chelsea, which is mediocre, but we can't help it because our, our airwaves are so expensive. You know what a museum show in New York, the kind of attention it gets? You want to dance naked there? You better lose, you know, a lot of weight you know, get in a lot of shape, really get your hair fixed up right. Because, you know, we're all looking at you and it gets out of scale in New York. And as a result, we have great shows, but that's all we have. Even if they stink, it's always the same top of the Himalayas. You don't know how high the mountains are unless you see the whole picture. And I think when I come to St. Louis, a place I've been a number of times, I'm always reminded of the greatness of art, and also the hardness, but the beauty of making it out of yourself. So I thank you uh, very much for coming here tonight. <laughs>uh, questions. The first, I saw way in the back a man sitting. Yeah, I was just curious why you decided it was necessary in an art lecture to throw in something about the tea party. Ah, are you in the tea party? Yes, I am. Boo! <laughs> you hate me. You hate me. I hate you. But we love each other. Here's why I felt it. Here's why I felt it. I want to ask you one simple question, then, and I will not argue back with you. I promise you this. You get the last word. Did you vote for Obama? No one in the Tea Party did. Not one person. Doesn't it tell you anything? Okay. I accept it. I hope we don't come to a civil war. I love you. You love me. We just hate each other right now. But I think this might work out. I think your team's going to have a big victory, you know? And uh, we'll see what you really want. Go for it. Go for it. I'm happy for you. If this is what you want, do it. Next question. Have I said anything insulting? No, you didn't answer the question at all. Why did I do it? Because I feel it very, very strongly. And everything I said tonight is more or less in that category. Yes. Since these are written words and not art, how do you find the use of this word? Right. If I say you can. What, and why? Here's what I think. If you can learn from bad art, she says, can you identify what was the worst show in New York and why? I'm going to give you a pretty simple answer. I'm a big fan of the Larry Gagosian Gallery. You already know what I'm going to say. Uh, there's a big show. In, I love Larry. If we don't have a big circus like that, if Larry decides to move to London and leave us, that's not so good. So before you throw out babies with bathwater, which the art world always knee jerks and says, all Larry Gagosian bad, that's not true. He's got a show up now of a beautiful six foot six young man named Dan Cologne, who New York, now I won't even say what New York Magazine said. Um, and the work is tr terrible, it's trash. 
their uh, paintings, but Jackson Pollock's made out of chewing gum. That's fine with me. You want to make a Jackson Pollock out of chewing gum? No problem. You want to charge 300 G for it? It's a little gross, but I understand artists love money. Uh, he put a, you know, a, a, a skateboarding uh, pike upside down. It's been done a lot in galleries, but he needed to do it. The reason I think the show is so bad is because it's a celebration of the de deleterious values of around 2007, when art really was just a placeholder for investors. You wanted a Damien Hirst, didn't matter what the F it looked like at, by the end. And Hirst in the very beginning, a real uh, renegade pumpkin. I mean it. He helped de-islandize England with his incredible anger and will. Anyway, people like Murakami, Hearst, they think they can play the system. Dan Cologne, you think you can play the system, but I'm, my guess is, unless you're like Andy, and maybe a few more, maybe Jeff, I know you hate that I say this, but the system is playing them. And the reason I hate the show especially is because it kills discourse and it makes everybody have the exact same opinion. You couldn't get one off word. You were there in New York. Anybody see the show here? Yeah, that's the kind of the drawback of having seen it. You go, oh well. So that's what I could, I, I would like to say in general, I would frown on this, uh, trying to return to the good old days of 2007, of saying that art is this decadent placeholder uh, uh, game for collectors. Yes, that's one of the things that it is for some people, but uh, let's not just celebrate it. Of course, the art world then knee-jerked and said, Larry Gagosian bad. Well, that's not true at all. Gagosian has another show uptown of a pretty unknown mid-careerist named uh, Dyke Blair that's very, very good and respectable and very low profile. So does that answer your question at all? Did you have anybody in mind that you hate right now? <laughs> name a name. Nobody's listening. We're alone. And I'll tell you what I think. We can play blood sport together. <laughs> You're close. You come back to me. Any other quick? Yes, artist. When you go into a curator or critique a show, if, if it's a star, like an artist, it's a big star, and they've done a beautiful show, and they're working more, and they're working more, like, for example, there's been a lot of big ones, like Mindy Wiley had most of his paintings done in China, I think. That's what I was told. But uh, did that change any of your opinion as, as opposed to going into a show where the artist actually does the work himself and immerse himself? Here was the question. Does it change my opinion if the, art, the show I'm seeing may not have been made by hand by that artist. No. I do not care how you get your art into that gallery. If you can job it out into China, go ahead. I find very, every photographer on earth almost has never actually touched their work. If you want to total up all the time the greatest photographers on earth ever worked, one and a half seconds. You know, if you like the hundredths of a second. but. I don't care. Very few artists, however, can get away with not touching their work and still embed thought into the material. But it can be done. It's a very metaphysical thing. Again, not to overstress it, but I think that Warhol did it. Uh, probably um, Jasper Johns would be humanly incapable of it because everything is about his you know, urge to make those tiny little brush strokes over and over and over and touch everything. And in my opinion, Coons has been able to pull it off from time to time. Mostly no, but when he does, it sends me. So I do never, ever put the handmade as the highest value. I put the made. I'm interested in it. I don't care if it's a Neolithic stone. I like stones that have been standing up. Nobody made the damn thing. Somebody just stood the damn thing up. I'll worship it, because thou shalt have no other gods before me. Any other questions, quickly? Yes, Laura, the great young curator, yay. Now I know I embarrass you. I'm like an uncle. Yeah. Yeah.
Well, Laura. Uh, Laura's asking, over the years, have I found myself now being more generous or harder? I have to say, you, you're almost like in my head right now. Wow! <laughs> I'm thinking a lot about that, and I have, in my heart, been feeling much more generous as I get older. I don't know what it is. It's the scale I'm writing on. Uh, New York Magazine is shiny, glossy paper. It's read by a lot of non-art world people, and I'm aware of them. I've never wanted to write just for our art world. I don't. I love art magazines, but I never wanted to write just for them ever. And so now, when I go to a crapola biennial or a terrible Greater New York or something. What's happening for me, and it's ruining my criticism, I'm sure, and it's a weakness in me, and it you know, may be the end of me. I don't know. I see the eight artists out of the 55 that I like, and I start to let those eight be the dominant factor for me. And then after I write that, I'm, I always have to slap myself and go, well, for 90% of the art world, they, only, they saw the 45 crap artists. And so people are thinking my work is off. And I'm, if I don't adjust that, to take in my reader, because I don't write for the artist, I don't even, I guess I write for me, but I'm really writing for the reader. And if I don't take in my reader and really question that, something's going to go off in my work. And I've got to fix this. My last three biennials, I made this mistake. I did it on Greater New York. My stomach kept saying, bad show, Jerry, bad show, Jerry. And I kept going, but I like these three artists. <laughs> and in my head, they became the whole show. That's inexcusable. Uh, really, I, I don't know what's going I'm nervous. <laughs> and as I see more and I want my, and I'm also one other minor thing. I'm really questioning the form of what I'm doing more than anything these days. I've noticed that since I write for magazines and probably we're, when you're my age, there won't be many magazines. They just won't exist. There are only going to be three newspapers probably, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, USA Today. Sorry. Hopefully those three will survive. It might just be the journal and uh, the Wall Street, and then that guy that left will be very happy, the tea, the PT party guy. Because then that side, that side will have won, and that's fine with me. Whatever people want. Um, anyway, long story short, I'm thinking a lot about the form of criticism since it's probably not going to exist on pa shiny paper especially. And that's why I'm experimenting in every way I can to see, since there is no money in art criticism anyway, no way. You're not going to make money, you guys in the back, if you think, yes, I'll be a critic and make money. Nope. Even the most famous critics make very little. They get a hundred bucks for a review, blah, blah, blah. I'm trying to play, since there is no money in this anyway, and you artists should be doing this too. Since you don't have to make one kind of art, you can make every kind of art that crosses your stupid little mind. You don't have to just be a painter or a sculptor. You can make anything you want. Listen, we drink cider. but so Apples existed, but you had to make the cider. Make cider. We eat wheat, but we had to make that wheat, okay? Make wheat out of what's already there. What I'm trying to say is I'm trying to experiment with every possible form I can lay my little mitts on. That's why I have this silly Facebook page where I make an idiot of myself, and a lot of people do, but I'm interested instead of having the one speak to the many, of the idea of the many speaking to one another coherently. Not like crazy name calling at the end of every comment thread, but actually see if it's possible to have a coherent, rash, not rational, irrational monstrosity, a 5,000 headed organism. That's what I'm interested in on Facebook. When I went on the stupid reality TV show, I wanted to perform art criticism for a much bigger audience. I think I did okay on TV, but as I listen, my wife never watched one single chapter. <laughs> she, of course, approved that I would do the show. I would never do it otherwise. I was paid $900 per episode, so I didn't get rich. Um, when I saw me on TV, how they edited it, I don't complain about it. I knew going in. 
I thought I was not clear or articulate enough about why I liked and disliked the work. I thought I had a pretty good personality. I was much thinner. I can't stand it. Um, I looked okay. I was good. If the person that was not edited well, everything was edited more or less how you saw it except the one St. Louis person. I'll be really honest with you, in the arguments, Jeannie Greenberg was the alpha male all the time in our arguments, which she liked. You know how whenever you've been on a panel, one person has a kind of say where you're sort of focused and listening to them and you go, yeah, maybe they're right, because I don't know. But Jeannie is much faster and brighter, much funnier than they cut her, and they cut her just to be a gorgeous, stylish, uh, you know, art dealer. I don't think that hurt. I don't think it was mean. I, I, but it, that was the only thing off. The thing I'm trying to get to about the TV show is while I watched the TV show and thought, hmm, not what I was looking for. <laughs> I didn't perform as well as I thought. As some of you may have noticed, I started writing these recaps afterwards. Did you read them? I hate you for not reading them. <laughs> and accidentally, what I did is I started reading the comments that started coming in and started in the scores and then the hundreds, then the thousands, and then it became a quarter of a million words generated because I started responding back. So people would say, Dear Jerry, you flaming A, blah, blah, blah. And I'd go, and I would address them and, and have, decide, this is not going to hurt my feelings. I did this weird thing. Let's see. An artist, I want you to be able to have something better than thin skin. You know, you're such babies sometimes. If I go, well, I didn't like the sculpture, but I do like the paintings. For the rest of your career, you won't talk to me, you big baby. It's just my opinion. You can't let anything be guided by rejection. If you're ever, ever, ever guided by rejection, then you're listening to the wrong demonic force. You know, just what am I trying to say? So I started to respond to people on the New York Magazine. Here, he's still talking. And it's uh, the New York Magazine site and found that there was another form for criticism. I'm astonished that young critics don't form online magazines and start these conversations with 5,000 5, headed organisms. Why not? What authority are you afraid to give up? There is no authority. The higher you move up in each world that you are in, there's a really weird thing. And I've sh anybody that's moved very high up in a world, you'll realize nobody's in charge. <laughs> I hate to tell you this, but this goes all the way to the top. So like when you've ever been at the UN, the place is falling apart. You're there and you go, nobody's in charge of this world. It's just nothing. Anyway, any other quick question? Yes, very quick. Now I'm really going to give like a rapid First, fire. I want to say thank you for your, I enjoyed the show. Thank you. So I, I did too. Thank you. I and I'm not trying to disown the show. I loved every second of it. Every second. Uh, second of all, can you, what your definition of an artist is? Okay. Is that's always, everyone makes their own definition. Okay. And what is your definition? Do you call yourself an artist? Sometimes. <laughs> then my well, definition. I'm on that title. Okay. On that title. Then you're sometimes an artist. I never question it. I'm going to be honest with you. If you call yourself an artist, you're an artist. My only job. I don't define it. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be cagey. I'm only interested in trying to define what I think is good and bad art. I'll tell you if you're a bad artist. I want to start another website, another form of criticism. It's going to be a bloodbath. It's going to be called art or not. Instead of hot or not, it's going to be art or not. Where you send your one JPEG to me in public and you go art or not and I go, no. <laughs> You're a bad artist. <laughs> really? Why not? Why not? So this, this old guy, you know, old Jew in New York doesn't like your work. So what? That's all you found out. That's why the better artists on that show might have had an advantage of not winning. Sometimes having the negative um, stamp on you won't hurt. But I don't define art. Art is whatever an artist tells me they make. Yes? Mm -hmm. 
Keith Tyson has invented a machine that is uh, makes a different work of art every time, and that produces um, a form of static noise and chaos, a lack of commitment and attention to certain things that need a little more attention. He answered it, but that's not the only prescription. It's art is, we don't know what it is, but we know what it is when we see it, <laughs> like pornography. Um, do you love Tyson's work? Earlier, yes. Right. When it seemed to have some coherence in the fact that it was spinning off in any direction, now it seems willed, um, defiant, hubris-filled, male, what? Contrived. It's. You are the vehicle. It is moving through you. My work. Every single one of us in this room that has made anything always goes. It's that great Bob Dylan quote when somebody asked, "How did how did you write whatever song?" And he goes, "Yeah, how the hell would somebody ever write a song like that?" <laughs> Whenever you've done anything that you think is even this good, you go. What the hell is that? You know, I was trying. I want to write like Dante or Emily Dickinson or Whitman. Those are my gods, but I can't. I try really hard, and yet no matter what I do, I can't. And yet something else comes out of me. Well, I'm, but I'm going to tell you this, artists. You better be self-critical. Not to the suicide point, for God's <laughs> sake. Look, can I really honest, watch this. When you're sitting in your studio alone at night and you're going, I don't have enough time. I don't live in the right place. I'm really kind of a sham. Okay, and you're feeling depressed and you want to get, you're bumming out. Bad, dark night of the soul. Here's what I want you to do. When the suicide meter is going up like this, <laughs> you go, yeah, I don't really, ha I don't, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bad schmoozer. I didn't really go to the right school. I don't really know art history. But right here, my lovelies, my prophets, I want you to say, but I'm an effing genius. <laughs> I want you to be delusional. Because no one is going to believe in your stupid art as much as you. You make squares. This one puts words together. That one like curates shows. Whatever. You're going to be gone in 100 years anyway. Nah, a couple of you will be remembered. What I'm asking is like, don't listen to the demons, but listen to them just enough. And Paul's telling me it is time to stop, and I'm sorry I've gone so long. But you have to be an incredibly complex combination of very self-critical, of always putting pressure on your work so you don't go Jim Dine on people's ass and just start like getting into gear and going. Although Dine invented fire, so he earned the right to make robes for the rest of time. So you, have to, you haven't even earned that. But I want to tell you something. You have to be both self-critical and delusional in equal measure. And that's all I'll tell you. I think I won't give you the, I'm not going to give you the last one. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for coming. And